Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, morning, wherever you're listening in from. Uh, today, we have part three of three of Foreigners in Japan. And we have the illustrious Paul Chapman, also known as Chappers, Chapnitsky, uh, PC, got lots of nicknames. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sensei. And I have to say, hashtag keep the flame alive, or Mark Hariaja will give me a hard time. Okay. Um, Paul started Aikido in Melbourne. And a bit about your martial background, Paul, please. Uh, sure. I started in 1994 at the uh, Aikido Shirokan City Dojo uh, under um, Tony Shaw, not the, not the Collingwood football player. Uh, and then one day, this person comes into the dojo with a white belt in tow. And that person turned out to be you, Sensei, because uh, I hadn't met you until that point. And when I saw what you could do compared to my teacher, your student, I was well impressed. And it turned out that white belt was not a real white belt because I thought, oh, great, another white belt. Um, that was Tong Chai Perriman, uh, who uh, you know I still think of fondly today, although he's no longer with us. Um, but that those early stages, the early first six months at the dojo in, in uh, I think it was, is that Lonsdale Street? Gosh, it's been a long time. My Melbourne geography is a bit hazy from those days. But that was in a, a Kyokushin Karate Dojo, and, I, and it did not inspire me at all to do karate. I just wanted to do Aikido. And it, I'm showing my age there by saying I found you in the yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and then you trained at the Shilokan for quite a while. Um, I'm going to come back to a lot of things. I just want to give an overview first. Um, then you went to Japan. That's right. So after about six months, I finished high school in Australia. I decided I wanted to speak Japanese, do some more Aikido. So I, uh, I went, went on an exchange to Shizuoka Prefecture. And imagine being almost what in was the center it, was of it to Hamamatsu? Uh, in Numazu. Numazu, sorry. Yep. Not, not far away. Um, imagine being sit, living really in a suburb close to the center of town, but there was a, a rice field behind your house. That was kind of shocking for me at the time. Um, coming from Melbourne, where the closest farm was probably an hour from my house. So that was cool. Walking through rice fields to get to the local school, that was cool. Being an 18-year-old doing like <laughs> year 13, I don't know if that was cool, but it was interesting. And it gave me a lot of time to do um, Japanese language study by myself. Uh, I was part of the judo club. And I found an Aikido, a Yoshinkan Aikido dojo in the neighboring town, which was the start of a long history of me traveling really far from where I live to go do Aikido. Okay. And then you came back to Melbourne and you came continued at the Shulukan? That's right. So um, I think about second year university, I decided that traveling from Monash Clayton and Monash Caulfield all the way to Thornbury was, was really going to wear out my car. So I decided to start an Aikido dojo and you great, graciously just agreed to teach there. So we, we created the, uh, the Monash University Aikido Club at the Caulfield campus, where Mark Hariaja uh, Sensei got his first start at Aikido. So, um, Paul, then you, you went to and fro in Japan many times, and you've trained at um, the Yoshinkan Hombu Dojo, you've trained at uh, Ando Sensei's Ryo Dojo, um, and also at the Renshinkai. Yes? That's right. Uh, and, yes. and yes. go on. Uh, I was actually also for a time an instructor at the Renshinkai Hombu Dojo. Oh, cool. Thanks to you. And roughly how long at each of the, I mean, you were at the Shudokan for a long, long time. How long oh. at the other dojos? Well, I'd like to think I'm still at the Shudokan in spirit and that I always will be. Can't get rid of me that easily. Uh, that said, Yoshinkan Aikido Ryu under uh, uh, Ando Tsunio Shihan, so Ando Shihan, was a total of about two years, two and a half years, one year in 1999, a year and a half in 2006, um, after I left uh, being deshi at the Shudokan, uh, Kido Shudokan in Melbourne. Um, with Chida Sensei, it was many years. I also had a branch dojo in Melbourne for about two and a half years uh, during the time that I was back in, in Melbourne. Um, That's right. So that was like 2009 to 2012. So for part of that time, I set up Red Shinkai Melbourne. Um, but of course, still part of Aikido Shudokan, both in spirit and I would still come to the dojo. Uh, yep. So I consider myself still part of your, your Aikido family. Um, again, whether you want me or not. <laughs> but that said, I've, I've been lucky enough to train under you, under Chida Sensei, under Ando Sensei. Uh, although my experience with Ando Sensei at the end of it was not so um, auspicious, but I still have a lot of uh, fond memories from my time there. Hmm. I, that Look, I want to talk about your time at the Shulukan and your 
position as an instructor and management separately. I want to talk about the differences and the similarities in each of the dojos that you train in. Okay. I, actually, I should mention I did a year at Mishima Renseikai, which is in the city of Mishima, which is next to Numazu in Shizuoka Prefecture. They only trained six times a month. It was actually started by um, Ter Terada Sensei, Terada Shihan, who was a co-founder of the Yoshinkan, which I found out later. And I, I have this one really cool memory I'd like to share. So I was a, an 18 year old exchange student in Japan. I could barely put a sentence together. Um, I could read some kanji and some of the, the, the kana. Um, it was their annual uh, embukai, so their annual demonstration. And he's wearing a hakama and he's doing his demo and he's already got gray hair and balding and looks like you know, he fits the role of the ancient Aikido master because I didn't really know anything back in 1995, Aikido or otherwise. I knew a bit about computers that, that will come up again. And he's in the middle of his demo and he grapples a guy to the ground and does Hadakajime from behind, which is a, a judo chokehold. And I'm thinking, are you allowed to do that in a hakama? <laughs> so that was shocking for me because I had no understanding of how, um, how uh, Shiora sensei and Terada sensei had come from basically Kodokan judo into Aikido, uh, one before the war and one after the war, and then had worked to towards uh, restoring a Aikido practice after the war. So I'd read a little bit, but yeah, that was that was interesting. And then afterwards, the great Aikido tradition of getting really drunk, which I didn't because I was eighteen, but seeing everyone get really drunk and eating um, their bentos, it was it was uh, it was quite a, a memorable experience. Before before everyone jumps up and down on the internet, uh, cursing Paul for calling calling Tarada Sensei co-founder of the Yoshinkan. That depends on who you read and what you read. And it's up for debate. Uh, I've spoken to Tarada Sensei about this and I will tell you about that some other time, but uh, depends on who you speak to and which slant you take. Um, it's correct or it's incorrect. It's no big deal, okay? No big deal. So please don't jump up and down on that I mean, one. At least he was probably very, very involved in it because most of the East Japan dojos were considered his dojos. So we were part of the sort of the Ter Terada group, you could imagine. Okay. And I also got to meet Amos Parker. So my Aikido teacher, um, who was a, a Yondan, probably about my age now uh, in Mishima, he was also an avid motorbike rider. And he just took me under his wing and you know showed me a lot of Japan. But he also took me to, I think it was Otsuka um, in, uh, in Tokyo. And we met with uh, Amos Parker to talk, because Parker Sensei was about to return to the US. And I remember meeting this other teacher who spoke, who was Japanese and spoke English fluently. And I thought, gee, I want to be like that one day. <laughs> so I had my two goals, become really good at Aikido, or at least not terrible, and become really good at Japanese, or at least not terrible. Okay. All right. I'm going I'm to have to put the break on your talking at points. Certain points. Go okay. <laughs> now, going back to my question, which you didn't answer, what are the similarities of training under, say, the Renshin Kai, the Yoshinkan Hombu Dojo, Ryu Dojo, the Shudokan. The reason I mentioned Mishima Rensei Kai is, to, is really to, is to contextualize my answer. So they're so similar that when I went back to Mishima, Mishima Rensei Kai in 1999 as a university student, I was visiting, they pulled me up in front of the class and said, this is Hombu Aikido. They got me to do Kihon Dosa in front of everyone. I'm like, why am I doing this? And they said, this is Hombu Aikido. And at that time I was training with uh, Ando Sensei Yoshinkan Aikido Ryu. So what you teach, what Ando Sensei teaches, what Chida Sensei teaches, you all have your own emphasis. You all have your own approach, your own style, just like a musician or an artist will have their own personality in their art, but you all have a common base. It's more than just the curriculum. It's, I think that you've followed a lot of the same teachers or some of these people were your teachers and my teachers. So there's a lot more in common than there is different. That's what I learned from Mishima Rensei Kai. Because they were a little bit more, as uh, John Marshall Sensei would say, a little bit more, um, is it agrarian in the approach? A little okay. bit less um, refined in that no. way, but it was a great place to, to train. Paul said earlier that when he came back to Australia and he started uh, the Renshin Kai, correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> when you came back, you said, Chida Sensei told you to come back and rejoin the Shudokan. And I told you to start up a wrenching Kai branch so Chida Sensei would have a, a dojo in Australia. Uh, do you remember that? Um, no, but I remember another thing that uh, Chida Sensei told me that showed that that is totally aligned with what you just said. Um, a long time ago, you said to me, Sensei, when I was in the dojo, you said, gee, Paul, you said, gee, Chapo, if, uh, <laughs> Chappers, if, uh, if I was this good at computers, I'd quit Aikido. 
And for a long time, I took that as an insult. But I told Chida Sensei once at a dinner, and he goes, your teacher was giving you a compliment. And I'm like, of course. So I think Chida Sensei has great respect for you and fondness for you. So I imagine that's exactly what he would have said. Uh, it was, it was um, yeah, I, the reason I'm saying it is because, like you said, there's a lot of similarities and not just in, in terms of technique too. Okay, now moving on. Um, your time at the Shudokan. Uh, people, you don't know this, but uh, Paul came back from Japan and I think it was maybe around 2007, 2006, 2007, and the dojo was in a very, very bad way financially. So um, I know he, he will balk at this, but if it wasn't for him coming in and saying, okay, I'm going to take over and manage the dojo, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. I'd, I'd be having, I'd have another job the Shudokan would have folded. So thank you, Paul Chapman, for saving the Shudokan and turning it around. Uh, financially, he got it back on its feet. Uh, it was in so much debt, uh, I kid you not. So thank you to this man. And Paul, what, what's, what, what was it like working and managing the Shudokan? Um, some of the best times of my life, I have to say. It was, uh, I, know, I remember the time very clearly. It was uh, mid-2004. Um, I think it was about June, because I left my, my first company around that time as a, as a full-time uh, CTO, Chief Technology Officer there. And that was a pretty traumatic experience. So going to the dojo was kind of like my shugyo, um, which in English means, uh, I think it's study journey, or just your studies is really a direct translation. Penance. penance. My penance. No, uh, <laughs> well, yes, that, I needed some of that as well, as you, as you well know. Um, Aikido helped round me out as a... As a uh, a complete individual or a more complete, less incomplete. However, since I, the time at the dojo, when I saw the, when I saw QuickBooks, I'm like, oh my God, we better do something quickly or the dojo won't be here. And I have a great love for, for you and for Aikido and for the Shudokan um, and for most of the people there too. <laughs> but I was, uh, I was shocked and I was like, okay, regardless of what I want to do, I have to make sure that, that this is going to continue. And at that time, I wasn't very good at sales. I wasn't very good at cold calling people. All these things were scary for me, despite um, being someone who is quite outspoken. And uh, I just thought, well, this is what needs to be done in order to, to achieve the goal. And so I called everyone. <laughs> I remember one person, one mother coming in because she was telling me on the phone how, well, I've got to pay for swimming and I've got to pay for tutors and I've got to pay for this and we've got to pay for that. And my comment to her was, we can't be your last priority. I think she was six months in arrears. And when Luke, uh, your nephew, who was also at the dojo at the same time as me, um, both running the office, when, he, when she came in, she said to him, and I found this out afterwards, oh, gee, the new person in the office is, is very pushy. And I, when he told me that, I'm thinking, well, of course I'm gonna be pushy if I'm trying to save the dojo, because if we, don't have, if we don't have the money coming in, we can't keep the lights on. We can't keep doing this great thing that we love. And to some extent, I keep, choosing a path in life where I guess you could say, even though I'm running a business, I'm not running it only with a profit motive. I have a mission, a vision in mind. And that sometimes comes before, well, this is an easy way to make a buck. And what I always liked about you, Sensei, was that you put your art first and the business second, but you needed to have someone there who would be like, okay, well, I'm gonna go chase everyone to make sure they pay. So, so what was the most challenging thing about running a dojo or working in the dojo, aside, aside from always not having enough money to do anything. Okay, that, that was, that was you, I think you took most of the stress for that. For me, it was more of an adventure, but disagreeing with you, or actually knowing when I should stop disagreeing with you. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, I was, I was your student and I was there to learn, but at the, in the office, I had to somehow, I probably could have been more uh, diplomatic about it at times, but pushing my point. And yeah, it's, it's something that I think it's a lesson I've taken away. I mean, I work with some of the biggest banks in Japan and it's not always a, an easy, friendly discussion about like we did a good job or things went according to plan as expected. But being able to face that down and not in a way where I'm, and this is a very Aikido thing to say, not where I'm their enemy, but where we can become one and work together because that is actually the goal. But, but that didn't happen, did it? You know, no, it did. You once told me, Paul, if you don't shut up, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't now, really but, think you hit me, um, but I wasn't entirely you know, sure. Uh, we, we, we butted heads a lot. And looking back, I was wrong. You were right. Uh, I think 
uh, I just had this vision as to how I wanted to go. And um, you, you, you dragged me kicking and screaming into the 21st century. You dragged the Shulukan kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Now, I'm going to, uh, what else? Would, uh, aside what else from working, working with me, what else would have been there? Sure. Uh, I mean, that, that was the personally challenging part. Like I said, it was some of the best times of my life. I mean, at the time, I, I mean, there were days when I'd come home from the dojo and I, as, again, I lived in the southeastern suburbs, so Caulfield, and you could go to Thornbury every day. It was a long way to go. Um, but I remember driving home down High Street, Thornbury, and thinking, this is, um, I love this. This is just, I want it to keep going. But I think what was really difficult was finding out, was discovering how that would fit into my, I guess, my, my bigger picture for life, like what I wanted to do. And I'd say that one of the challenging things for me was at that time, I was still pretty immature. Um, I loved Aikido. I didn't love teaching it. <laughs> and yet I was an Aikido instructor <laughs> in the Shudokan. And so that was the challenge. Uh, and I'm sure it's a challenge for a lot of, a lot of Aikido teachers where, you know, there are people that love teaching, but they don't love teaching everyone they have to teach. So for mm -hmm. me, it was a bit different. I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have true confidence in what I was doing. That was challenging, despite any uh, indications yeah. to the contrary. I, that I was think challenging. That's, that's one of the difficulties of being a professional teacher. You have to take on board everyone and make a commitment to, to teach everyone. Now, I'm going to let everyone in on a secret here. If you want to run a dojo, and I'm not just talking about, uh, uh, I'm not specifically talking about small dojos or twice a week, three times a week. Um, I'm talking about full-time uh, permanent dojos. Then you need someone like this man in front of you. Um, my, my, my curse was one, I didn't have enough money to pay him what he deserved. Two, I didn't listen to him. And the hardest part of his job, I will tell you right now, was managing me. Not managing the dojo, but managing me. And I think that's the problem that if you find someone good, first, you've got to be able to pay them. Otherwise, you know, second, and I'm sure anybody would, would agree with this. Uh, people who work for Chida Sensei, people who work for Ando Sensei, people who work for Paya Sensei, the hard part is managing us all bastards. Um, and, and, but but that, that's what it is. Um, and so if you have... If you're running a dojo and you have someone like this in front of you, one, try and hold on to that person, two, try and pay them what they're worth. I never did because I never could. Uh, so I apologize for that. Now, if they, if they um, while, while, while we hold on, while I'm on a roll, um, over the years, I've had many people manage the dojo and the three people who have, uh, actually four people who've taken it to where it is today, it was one, a guy called Jeff, Jeff Henschel, two, Faith Garner, three, Paul Chapman, and now Enrique Chung. And really, they've got the hardest jobs in the world trying to manage me. Sorry, Paul, over to you. And sorry, to these people, I say thank you. Over to you, Paul. I say thanks to them as well, especially Enrica, because she's the yeah. current person running the dojo. Um, my, I, I just wanted to contextualize this a bit more. I didn't leave the Shudokan in 2006 because I was in any way unhappy working there or in any way. And I'm, this is not a, this is completely true, by the way. Um, I think we'd found, my recollection is we'd found a great equilibrium. We were on an even keel. It was great. We could work together. The, the, the friction that you talk about, I think was earlier in the piece yep. because we're getting used to each other. And I didn't think that you were against being commercial any more than I was because I didn't want to just make it into a McDojo either. And I, you certainly didn't have never wanted to do that. I, I left the dojo for my own reasons. Hmm. I, 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 I had no doubt about that, uh, but thanks for saying that. Um, <laughs> just in case anyone, you know, the, it's not like the internet to take, you know, take something out of context and get it completely wrong. And uh, look, people, uh, Lena, who, who produces these, uh, Hashtag keep the flame alive interviews, tried to find pictures of uh, Paul Chapman and she couldn't. All she could do was find pictures of him being okay. Uh, and he has been okay for me many, many times. In 2005 in Japan, when uh, we won the Togubetsu Embusho, um, the 50th anniversary of the All Japan Yoshikan Aikido demonstration, uh, he was one of my two UKs. Um, and how much did we practice for it, Paul? 
Um, in the lining up part, you said, I want to do this, this, and this, and Shun will go first. I'm like, us. That was it. Uh, and and I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> I stuck to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and thank you to Shun, too, for being my okay there. But, um, you know, we're talking about a very special person here who's good at Aikido and who's also got a good business head on his shoulders. Uh, not only, but also, he's a translator, and he's translated many, many times for top teachers here. Uh, Paul, we'll come to Money Tree and, and what you do now later. But um, we also did a lot of corporate talks, didn't we? Oh, they were great. I, really, I'm, I have a lot of fun memories of those, except for the one in Indonesia on tiles. <laughs> because being a Kenny on tiles is worse than concrete. Just I forgot about that. Uh, I was young we, enough to survive. We, uh, we used to use Aikido as a metaphor and we used to do corporate presentations. And uh, it went down really well. And everyone was different. And there was no planning. We, we just worked off each other. And it was really good. Uh, I, I put that one to in, Indonesia in the back of my mind. Now, <laughs> you brought up Indonesia. How hard was that trip? Oof. When everyone Real. got sick. Yeah, that was, yeah, never, never have, uh, never have uh, roast pork in a paper bag from a street stall in Bandung, unless, <laughs> unless you're born there. It was yep, great, definitely. but that, yep. that, that's, that's the gift that keeps on giving. I remember that day. Yeah. And Paul, you've been okay for me many, many times in demonstrations, yeah? Yes. What's it like? Yes. I've never, I've never asked my UKs that question before. Um, it's always exciting. Uh, because of your approach. Uh, if I can add something to what you said before about how much Please. you asked the question, how, how, how much preparation did we do? You once said to me, and a lot of the things you've said, I take, to, I take into, into the business world with me as well, because I learned a lot about leadership from work, you know, training under you and working with you. Um, you said, you know, if we can't get it, if we can't pull it together quickly, you know, as professionals, what are we worth? And that's very true. If your craft is this, you should be able to start doing it at the drop of a hat. That said, of course, you did put huge amounts of effort into coordinating demonstrations and getting other people to do the right thing. But your demonstrations, the hallmark is that they're spontaneous and that there's a, a strong element of, of uh, not cool. sincerity, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, authenticity. Even though when I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to kill you, I am trying to hit you. <laughs> and seeing all these YouTube comments, because I think you're at the 50th anniversary, the 50th All Japan Yoshinkan Aikido um, demonstration that, that was the highlight of my Aikido career. Um, that uh, other than studying my dojo in my six tatami mat room with my kids during the coronavirus pandemic, <laughs> uh, that's my other highlight. But that was the highlight. And that's been reposted on YouTube a lot of times. And people say things like, oh, it's fake. It's this, it's that. And this is from, this is because, you know, Aikido is something that you have to be on the receiving end of it to see that it's real. Um, or to, to, to understand that what they did is not actually real. That also happens. But that spontaneity, that authenticity, that came from not knowing what's going to happen, but knowing I had to hit you hard, otherwise I'd get in trouble. Um, and you told me early in my career that, uh, I call it career, but early in my time as a student uh, about Darren Sensei, so Darren Friend um, from New South Wales, and that, you know, he would always, if you threw him off, <laughs> he'd get up and attack harder. That was always my that was my gold standard that I, 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 I strove to achieve and didn't always quite get there. Yeah. And, and there's been a few times when you've landed the blows too. I just never let it show. That's um, another thing I learned in the dojo. Don't let the bastards know they got you. Yeah. Um, now, funny you should mention Darren Friend Sensei. He was one of the persons who instigated this interview. I wanted to interview yeah. you, but... He, he said he was going to get you to write something for his newsletter. But when he found out I was going to interview you, uh, he sent me some questions. And so um, what, one of these questions is, how is that your training in Aikido and your principles helped, helped you in your, in your business process, in, in your approach to business? You've um, already said some of it, but is, is there anything else you'd like to add? An embarrassing extent, uh, you know, when you, you steal the, the technique of your teacher or your teachers or your teacher's teachers, and then people think that you came up with it yourself. Um, so one thing I like about, I liked about Aikido, other than the fact that you didn't have to punch someone in the head or kick them in the head to take control of a situation. That was the teenage me. 
this idea, and I remember there's this old video of, uh, uh, of Gozo Shioda talking about, you know, the weak controlling the strong. And in a startup context, you're weak, you have nothing. Um, but at the same time, you can put yourself out there in ways that others can't. And so we have a, there was a company that would copy our app a lot in the early days of Money Tree. We, we're not an app company anymore. We're a, we're a data platform, financial data platform. And I learned that I couldn't attack them from, from a position where they're strong. I couldn't do things that would put them in a position of strength. I had to, I had to get them from an angle where, from a business perspective, where they couldn't follow us, where they couldn't do the same thing we could do without giving up what they were doing. And I've since learned that's called contrapositioning. So contrapositioning your business. Little plucky startup does something that big company can't do without sacrificing their existing business. And to me, that was pure Aikido because it's this idea of, I'm going to make you think you're in a stronger position, but actually I'm in the strong position and I've got the better angle and I can actually bring my strength to bear and bring my momentum into, into it. And you can't, but you don't realize that till it's too late. And that's very Aikido. Like, I think that's the, the core of Aikido technique and we use it in business a lot because we, we are small. We can't get a big company to do what we want just by saying it or by smacking our fist on the table. Um, we can't do it through overt power. We have to do it another way. So that's one very Aikido concept that I use in business. Excellent. And money I, no one ever told, none of my teachers ever told me that. Uh, and what about with negotiation? That is a good one. Um, has, has anything in Aikido helped you with negotiation? And if, if there hasn't, you know, you don't have to uh, make stuff up, just say. It be it. No, I, look, I, I, I'd say I didn't, I think the way I am, as a person in business and in life is very influenced, greatly influenced by studying Aikido for 20 years uh, from 18 to about 30 something, 38, 39. Um, and as a result, it's just how I am. So, you know, you often said Aikido is a way of life. And that I remember I asked you once, I think we we're making one of the martial arts DVDs. So it's probably about 18 years ago, 19 years ago. How long ago? Yeah, that's not very long. Yeah, it's a long time ago. But I asked you, you know, what do you think about all these people who eventually leave the dojo? And you said, well, you know, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like a school and some people graduate and leave. Some people graduate, become teachers. You know, the door is open. You know, if we don't use our Aikido in real life, what's it for? And I may have, I don't know if I ad libbed any of that. Editorialized no, it. That's how I remembered it. And it's like, well, you know, I've taken, you know, what I've learned and who I became in the dojo. And I just, that's me in life. And so that's a small, that's a, a no small win for me anyway. In negotiation, how do I use Aikido? Aikido puts you in the perspective of the other person is not someone you hate. It's not someone you want to get revenge on. You're not trying to push their face into the ground and then stomp on their head. You want to get them into a position where they will listen to you, where we're facing in the same direction, where we have the same goals. And so there are a lot of tactics and strategies around that, but that objective of they're not my enemy I need to, I, I don't want to, I'll, I'll give you an example. So sometimes someone wants to leave the company. Maybe someone really didn't get along and it doesn't happen that often. Every now and then you get someone who you really hope they don't become a stalker because they might, you know, they might have a, a grudge. And so the best way to deal with that is for them to feel like they've won. The company gets what they want, which is, okay, you're not a good fit. It's not working out. We've got to go our separate ways, but we don't have to make them feel like they've lost that they've been punished, that they've been destroyed because then they might come back <laughs> and be a stalker. But even worse, I mean, why do that to someone? It's not going to make my life better. It's not going to make the company better, but it will resolve the situation. So that sort of, I guess, meta way of thinking that Aikido teaches, I think it's very aligned with the way we should strive to be in, in, in not just in business, but in life. So, you know, people often say with martial arts, there are no rules on the streets. It's like, yeah, except the law. And... <laughs> And of course, ethics, morality. I mean, the truth is maybe we can't expect the other person to have ethics, morality and follow the law, but does that mean we don't? So it comes down to, you know, what kind of proportionate response do we want to bring to bear? So even in a negotiation, if they play hardball, well, you've got to show that you're strong. And so I often say to my co-founders, we're, we're the gentlemen of fintech. You know, we're not the bruisers. We're not, we're not the brawlers. We're not going to go into a street fight with someone, but we're not going to let them push us around. Okay, so look, um, we're, we're going to move on. And I purposely didn't mention Money Tree up until now. Um, Sorry. No, 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 I wanted to. And yeah, there's the advertising there. Um, you started up uh, Money Tree as an app. 
So there you are, a foreigner in Japan, right? Uh, teaching Aikido or not, not teaching Aikido, but you know, being an instructor in the Renshin Kai. Yes, uh, being an instructor in Renshin Kai. Uh, you started up this app. What was it like being? You know, your your Japanese is is fantastic, so there's no issue there. But did you was there any comeback to you know being a foreigner, starting up a business, starting up this um, teaching? I've not really talked about these kinds of things in an interview before, and, and uh, I'm happy to share it here. Um, but I'll preface it by saying it's been a, a very positive experience, but it's been challenging, much like being in the dojo, where I've become a better person as a result of what I've gone through. But it wasn't always it wasn't always uh, um, an easy an easy path. Um, starting a business in Japan as a foreigner is not a common thing, certainly not for someone um, from an English speaking country. So as a result, there are a lot of things that being sort of a white Japanese speaker that you get some advantage or just a foreign Japanese speaker, there are some advantages to that. People find you interesting. You know, you, you didn't work for someone they hate or some company that they're against, they won't work with, you know, you've come basically with no, no history. But on the, on the flip side, there is a, you know, there is a glass ceiling and uh, a very, very good friend of mine who um, is a successful businesswoman, former investment banker, she said to me, Paul, your experience in Japan is like what women experience in business every day, which is you're always explaining while you're there. People don't expect you to do what you're doing. And, uh, and at some level, like, you know, you've got to, you have to overcome their assumptions about who you are, why you're there, you know, what you can do. Um, and much like women in business, some of our investors, some that didn't invest ultimately, and some that did invest, they would ask the question, are you going to go home? I'm like, yes, I'm going to go back to my house after this. They're like, no, no, you're going to go back to Australia. And that's much like what I think a lot of women face in, in uh, the professional world, which is, are you going to get pregnant? So in some ways, there are a lot of parallels. I don't claim to know what that experience is like, but someone who does said it's a lot like that. Um, uh, I can, I can empathize. I bet you can, Sensei. Oh, okay, sorry, keep going. Actually, on that point, what was it like starting up the dojo in 1980 in Australia, because I grew up in Australia and sure I'm white European, but I'm also Jewish. And it was not the most friendly country to, uh, to people like me at the time, but I could hide. I could just not tell anyone and people wouldn't know, but you can't hide your background sensei. So was it challenging? Yeah, it was, uh, it was challenging starting up a dojo, you know, getting work, getting jobs. I, I'd go, I, I, I'd been for interviews. Um, and as I rocked up you know, a person would say, can I help you? I said, I'm here for the interview. And they said, position's taken. And you know, there were people walking in after you going for that same interview. Um, you know, people coming to the dojo and saying, I want to see the instructor. I'm the instructor. They go, no, no, the real instructor. Um, maybe because of my size, my color, you know. And then not, not only that, but people wanting to not so much take you on, but be resistive all the time. Um, going for loans, um, you know, I've, I've even written letters and then rocked up and people said, did you write this letter? Uh, in Japan, going to, you know, landing in Narita with students and they were breezing past and I had to prove that I was there and show my obi and my hakama and stuff. Uh, but, you know, say la vie, that's, that's life and you just get on with it, huh? You don't, you don't forget these things. You don't forget it. But, you know, you just get on with it. I've never really had that overt racism in Japan. Um, in Australia, for, you know, as a child, it was mostly, it was like either teasing or bullying. So it wasn't, wasn't anything I couldn't overcome. But it's um, institutional aspects of racism where it's not like, you know, a, 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 a race theory on supremacy, but more a case of, well, you know, we don't expect you're going to stick around in Japan, so we're not going to invest in your company. That's a real barrier, um, and that's hard to overcome. But there are people who are pioneers who overcome that. And I mean, I'm not—I'm not the only person in Money Tree. I'm not the only founder. I'm one of three, four, or four founders, if you include our chairman. So we've all managed to do that. But that said, I mean, you know, we are white, bilingual, English Japanese speakers, so we have some advantage there. But that said, we've been able to, I suppose, blaze a trail to some extent. You blazed a trail in Australia, like. So some, hearing that someone said, where's the real teacher? In my mind, you are the archetype of what a real teacher looks like. 
uh, you know, maybe back then I, I didn't portray that. But you know, it's interesting you what you said you about that, that person, the, <laughs> the type of racism, <laughs> the type of racism, because uh, I think here in Australia and in Japan, in my experience, in, in which has been in dojos in Japan, uh, you looked upon strangely because of your color, but then you're given a chance to prove yourself. I know people are going to find fault with this kind of logic, and that's fine too. Uh, and then you're accepted. Whereas growing up in Malaysia, no matter how good you get or how good you are at what you do and what you prove yourself, you are still who you were born first. Mm, so, yeah. and, and that's endemic and that's stuck. And, and, and that's why Malaysia is such a backwater, unfortunately. It's, it's something they've never, never gotten rid of. Anyway, moving on, Paul. Um, you know, again, from Darren Sensei, yeah? um, as an entrepreneur, um, do you see Aikido as being relevant today? Or is it just a, a nice, interesting old martial art that we do? Or is there relevance? I mean, you don't do Aikido anymore. You don't train uh, anymore. But how is it relevant for you? And, and do you see its relevance in the world? I think it's more relevant than ever, but it's also less popular be than ever because it, it has a lot more competition. And I don't mean mixed martial arts. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, where are we, 2020? 12 years ago, there was no iPhone, there was no iPad. Um, people, there's, a, there are, there's way more competition for people's time. And when you look at social media, what you can see, what films well is interesting. And what, look, what doesn't film as well to certain people is less interesting. So it does give me some concern for the future of Aikido. But I do think that it's more relevant than ever because it's one of, I mean, from a, from a martial perspective, um, of course, if you, especially in Japan, if you get into a fight, you're going to go to jail very quickly. Uh, and if you hurt someone, you could go to prison for a long time. It's not a society that that tolerates, you know, a bit of brawling. It's not like not hopefully Australia doesn't either, but it's pretty strict. So if you have to do something, I think you'd want to you'd want to be pretty sure that you're not going to cause permanent injury to the other person, or at least you have a great chance not to not to do that. So I think that's relevant. Um, in a litigious society where people sue each other, which is the US, Australia is probably becoming a lot more like that now as well. Again. You know, people can go after your your house, your assets, if you if you injure someone too much, they can't work anymore um, because you were in a fight and you you, you mashed mash their arm or something. Um, you know, so not non-violent approaches to violence, to controlling violence, I think are very relevant. But at a at a meta level, um, I don't want to sound too like intellectual around about this stuff, but look at the level of like how you think Aikido makes you stronger. Um, the way that I learned it with you, the way I've learned it with Ando Sensei and Chida Sensei, it made me a lot stronger. It, it gave me, it put me on the path to, I guess, true strength and true self-reliance. It gave me what I needed to one day do what I'm doing now, which has been a very challenging role spiritually. Um, and when I say spiritually, I mean, at times, you know, you get sick of getting kicked in the teeth every single day and being told no, 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 no. Um, but at some point, you know, you, you, you can go around the corner and a few less no's, a few less kicks to the teeth. So that aspect of it is what I take to work every day is that I can have that internal, I can have that conversation with myself or I can just put myself in that frame of mind. And, you know, used to say in, in a lot of the seminars, like, you know, this is Kamai, but, you know, you'd be like, this is, Kamai, this is a Kamai too and all these different ways. And I think your point was Kamai can be whatever it needs to be as long as internally you're ready, you're prepared. And the word kamairu means to prepare in Japanese. So that internalization of kamai makes the really, and when I say scary, I don't mean scary because I'm going to get hit. I mean scary because the company could close. You know, this is a long time ago now, but we wouldn't raise the money. Um, a huge customer is going to leave. All these things are actually quite scary. And mm -hmm. having that internalization of kamai, that really helps because then they don't know that you're like, you want to jump out the nearest window because you don't really want to be there, but you're going to go do it because that's the job you've got to do. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, look, um, we're going to start winding up now, right? No, normally I ask you for your last words, but I'm going to ask you pointedly a couple of things. Of your, your advice to someone, one, starting up a dojo uh, from a business point of view, one, just a couple of, couple of words or a couple of points. 
Okay. Um, get used to marketing and selling. If you're not going to do that, you haven't got anything to share with anyone. You are a great marketer and a good salesperson, but you also said, I don't want to sell and I don't, don't want to, I don't want to do uh, marketing. Um, that was my sales pitch. It's a good point. It was, <laughs> no, I can still learn. Um, but I think the idea that you don't want to tell the whole world about what you're doing and you don't want to talk to 50 people and only three walk in the door. Um, as much as I didn't like selling, when we started the, the Monash University Aikido Club, I think I spoke to a hundred different people one afternoon uh, on o, during O week. And I just stopped them and say, hi, do you know about Aikido? And I had this kind of haircut. So I must've looked like some kind of uh, religious zealot, but none of it was religious, of course. And, uh, and you know, amongst those people, um, you know, Mark Hadiaja was there, uh, but that was necessary to get everyone in the door because you may have the best, whatever it is in the world, but if you haven't got a, if you don't create a path for the world to find it, you're going to be by yourself. So these are things that some martial artists, not yourself potentially, but they say, I don't want to do sales. Or, I don't like selling. Oh, I don't want to do cold calling or, you know, call back all these people or call these students who haven't been coming. That's part of the course. And when you build up your dojo, you can get your students to do it and they have to learn to do that as well. Because if you want to be a successful teacher, you can't choose your students, your students choose you. Now you can choose who you think is your most talented and put more effort into them, but to survive and survival is everything up to a point, but it's a big thing to survive. You have to let, you have to take this, the students you're given. And actually I was having a discussion uh, with someone at work today and they said, Paul, you're very good at accepting people for how they are. And I thought of you, Sensei, um, because I learned that in the dojo. You know, we'd have all sorts of people come in the door and some had this personality defect. Others were just another way and you accepted them all, but you also didn't accept that they should stand still. And I, that's the point I, I, I made to the person I was talking to today. I said, look, I do accept them how they accept how they are, but I don't accept, I don't expect them or accept them, except they're staying, standing still. They have to build from that. They have to grow. If they don't grow, they're out. Well, you already answered the next question. So, oh, great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, what, what about the, something about the day to day running of a dojo? So it doesn't fall on its face like the Shudokan nearly did back, back in 07. That's easy. That's easy. You have to make sure that your, the money coming in the door will pay for what's going out the door every month. And you've got to get to that minimum level of survivability. In, in startups, they call it ramen profitability because all you can afford to buy for food is, ra is cup ramen. So yeah. cup noodles. So and, and getting to ramen profitability is important. And, and so don't pay would, your rent on your credit card. No, <laughs> I let you do that. <laughs> I do. Oh, uh, cool. All right, last question, Paul. Uh, yeah, last question. You, you, you've left a legacy in the Shudokan. What would you like your legacy to be, or what would you like to see as part of your legacy in the Shudokan? You, you've played a bigger role than than you can possibly imagine. You're not just talking about like all the templates that I left behind in, uh, in Word. <laughs> no, no, a lot of them didn't change, but yeah, no, no. Um, Both on and off the mat, on, on or off the mat. On the mat, I want everyone to say ryotemochi, not rotemochi, but that's going to be pretty hard. <laughs> It took me a long time to say to learn how to say ryotemochi instead of rotemochi. Um, no, that's that's the joke one. Uh, I'll, you can say I'll, I'll settle for sensei instead of sensei. <laughs> <sighs> That'd be a good one. Um, look, more so than my legacy, it's not much of a legacy. My contribution doesn't mean anything if the Shudokan doesn't continue to bring in new students who learn something and then take that out into the world. Um, you know, I've often thought that I'd like to nominate you for one of those, you know, Australian of the year awards, because you, I, I see you as this unsung Australian hero. Yeah. I know you're from Malaysia, but you're Australian for a long time. I, I see you as this unsung Australian hero who's done all this work to help people better themselves. And you've selflessly done this over three, over three decades now, just over three decades. It's a long time. Most people aren't that dedicated to a job that pays them way more and gives them a lot of status in society. Um, I'd like to see the dojo continue and to keep paying forward what 
what benefits it's uh, it's already been. I guess it's its current members have gotten. So Enrica, I remember when she was deciding whether she was going to become Uchi Deshi, and since John and I were like, "Don't do it, don't do it," she did it. Um, and now she's running the dojo, and now she's I would imagine one of you, if not your top instructor, one of your top instructors, one of your top students of all time. That's a good legacy. I. Mark Hariaja, you know, I, I didn't have anything to do with him learning Aikido other than I gave him the opportunity because I wanted to have a dojo at the, at the university. That's a nice legacy. So I think my legacy is that it continues and that people continue to benefit from what those people are doing. Okay, thank you. And have you got any final words? Sensei, what's your plan for the Shudokan after your retirement? Uh, Oh, well, that was a question. <laughs> that was my question. Okay, so short-term plan is to survive this COVID thing. And uh, next year we find out if we can survive financially. Um, my plan after retirement is to die. That's simple. That's my retirement plan. Yep. Awesome. I so, take that, mean, that means you're not going to retire. That's great. I have a choice, do I? You know my finances. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, awesome. Everyone, very much. Uh, I cannot thank this man enough for all that he's done for me. Uh, I haven't always been nice to him. I've been really harsh with him. I've heard him a few times in demonstrations. You remember the one in Gippsland? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, but, but he's always been there. He's always had my back. And he's the epitome of a good deshi. So thank you very much, Paul. Uh, people, the next interview... Um, is going to be in two weeks and it's only if you want it. So Robert Mustard Sensei rang me yesterday and he said that he would like to interview me. I know I've already been interviewed and I put that to him, but he said that he'd like to take me to task one ace down to another and I can't back down, etc. Uh, I'll leave it to you people. Would you like me to be interviewed by Robert Mustard Sensei? Uh, are there any things you want him to talk about? Would you like me to throw it back at him? So, <laughs> nice one, Paul. Um, so, look, if we get enough uh, positives or uh, affirmative answers, we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll move on and I'll go on with my normal interviews. So, if you want me to be interviewed by all grumpy sensei, I mean mustard sensei, please uh, say something on Facebook. Thank you very much, Paul. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Bye-bye.